All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, so this gentleman here uh, has a video put up 10 hours ago, amillennialism debunked in one verse. All right, so let me just preface all this by saying I am not uh, an amillennialist. Okay, I don't uh, subscribe to any labels. Those labels are for... Um, for other people okay let me just put it nicely for for a change those labels are for outsiders okay hello welcome back to my channel sober and vigilant ministries and this is Jake coming back at you again uh, today is we're going to talk about debunking a millennialism with one verse okay debunking a millennialism with one verse before we do that, let's go give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. What I want to bring you to is, is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to read verse 3 to give verse 4 context. But uh, verse 4 is the verse that I'm, I'm referring to about debunking a millennialism. But it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So the small g, God of this world, is Satan. Wrong. That's unbelievable. It's, he says it so matter-of-factly. It's interesting. Because a lot of people will agree with him. It's as if all these people have no understanding whatsoever of the Ten Commandments, in particular the very first commandment, the very first one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There's only one God. There are, there's not multiple gods. You're preaching a different religion, foreign from the Word of God, when you claim Satan is a god. And so let me show you a couple of things here that I find it interesting. It's like a phenomenon. I don't know how people have gone so far off so far away from understanding the Word of God. I don't know how this has happened, uh, but it is a phenomenon, and I think it is a testament, uh, an example, if you will, that we are for sure in the last days. You notice here in the 1611, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, In whom the God, capital G, of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. All right. I think people are making too big of a deal. That's just my opinion. But I think people make too big of a deal out of this being capitalized, not being capitalized. It should be capitalized, but it doesn't negate the fact that there's only one God. It doesn't negate Exodus 20, verse 3. All right, so let me show you visually, if I can, if I can figure out where I'm at. Right there. I don't know if you can see this. Right there, I get in whom the God, that's a capital G in the 1611s. It should be capitalized. It, it And it shouldn't be that big of a deal to where if it's not capitalized, that it completely changes what that word means that's ludicrous to in my opinion okay yeah, it's crazy to say well because it's not capitalized it means the exact opposite that's yeah that's going overboard that's gone that's going too far okay so let me point out a couple of verses here for you all right Let's go with, uh, let me start here because this is a great example here. 
in 2 Corinthians 3, the chapter before. All right, so this is 2 Corinthians 4. All right, 2 Corinthians 3, we read, Even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. This is God that puts the veil upon our hearts and he removes the veil. He's the one that takes it away. Alright? It's God. It's not Satan. Satan doesn't take it away once you believe in God. That, that, that's, that's, not, that's not a reasonable thought. Okay? It's God. There, and there's only one God. Don't lose sight of that. There's only one God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me means that there's only one God. Alright. Now, let's go to uh, Isaiah. Isaiah 6. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed right so let's go let's draw let's make a parallel oh let me think of the words real quick here in thir in Matthew 13 for this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now, as I pointed out before, uh, it's interesting. This single word, I, is referring to Jesus. Jesus is the one that heals us. You notice here in Isaiah, it says convert and be healed. Specifically in Matthew, it says I should heal them. This is talking about God, and this is talking about God. And it's a, another example, if you will, that Jesus is God Almighty. I, I find that interesting. All right, in John 12, he has blinded their eyes who has? Satan? No, God. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. It's interesting to me because there's not just one example to support this. It's all throughout the Bible. And it's obvious. It's God. God's in control of all of it. And this idea that there, Satan's a God, that's not supported by the Bible anywhere. I could show you the entire Bible and say, see, nowhere in the Bible does it say Satan is God. Because it does not ever say Satan is a god. It, not once. Not a single time. Alright. Alright, so what else was I going to show you? And uh, it says here that he is blinding the minds of them that believe not. Now, uh, this verse tells you that Satan is alive and well up on the earth. And that he... No, it doesn't. Oh, you're just making stuff up now. With no understanding. He is out in the world blinding people to the gospel. So, oh, golly, you know, it, it just it bothers me to no end. Just the idea that you say Satan is a god, that's troublesome. I, I, I feel bad for you. Really? This is not talking about Satan. Talking about the Lord. The Lord. The Lord is the one that 
blinds the eyes and hardens the heart. The Lord. And we have examples. I could show you more. Pharaoh, for example, his heart was hardened by God. Not by Satan, but by God. God's in control, buddy. And if you're calling Satan God, there's something wrong. So we know that. Now let's turn over to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, and I'll start with verse 1. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on that dragon, that old serpent, which is devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season so what a millennialist believe is that we are in the figurative thousand year millennial reign which could or could not be a thousand years it could just mean that it's a long time it can't be exactly 1,000 years. Do I really need to to show you that it can't be a 1,000 years? No man knows the day or the hour when the Lord comes. Okay. So, no man knows the day or the hour. Alright. So, Second uh, Peter 3, for example... 2 Peter 3. <laughs> I mean, if you don't know what the Bible says, how can you know this stuff, right? The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So it can't be exactly 1,000 years. Otherwise, we would know exactly when he's going to come. Oh, it, it would be the coming of the Lord's Day Eve or whatever, you know. Like Christmas Eve, it would be like the... We'd all be... Sitting in our lawn chairs, man, you know, having barbecues and waiting, looking up in the sky, waiting for the Lord to come on the last day. We don't know when the last day is going to be. It could be today. Uh, we don't know. So it can't, therefore, it cannot be exactly 1,000 years. Okay. It, the idea is just nonsense. All right. So again, um, one more thing. One more thing. Okay. So making a big deal out of uh, thousand. I've heard this being used. I'll use it. It's a good verse. It's a good example. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. Alright, so every beast of the forest belongs to God, and the cattle upon a thousand hills belongs to God. Now, on that 1,001 hill, that doesn't belong to God. It's just the 1,000 hills. Right? I mean, you're a literalist, right? You're going to take this literally exactly 1,000 hills... And therefore, the 1,001 hill and beyond do not belong to God. No, no, that's... <laughs> Look, I'm as literal as anybody, really. But when it comes to this stuff, you got to use some common sense. All right. You think about, well, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus says, nah. I say unto you, until seven D times seven. So that's uh, 490 times. So that 491st time, you don't have to forgive them, right? According to Jesus. Is that, are you going to stick with that? Because I, I think you're on the wrong side of this and you're lacking understanding. And, isn't it curious, when we read, for example, 2 Corinthians 4, 
It talks about minds being blinded. Are we not seeing an example of this? And why why is this gentleman's mind blind? Well, it's because he doesn't believe. And I could I'll show you. He doesn't believe what this says. And that uh, you know that Satan um, is not really all the way bound, but he you know he just that the gospel was able to go out from Jerusalem, and this is all spiritualized, and it's not a physical, visible, thousand-year millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ from Earth. It's just saying that he's reigning from heaven right now, and so forth and so forth. But here's my thing: if Satan, it says the Word of God here says that Satan is bound during this thousand-year millennial reign. And that there is a seal put upon him in the bottomless pit. They should deceive the nations no more. So if he's if he's not deceiving the nations anymore, that tells me that over here in Second Corinthians uh, four four, that he is out right now deceiving people, and that he is blinding the minds of them that believe not. So uh, we cannot be in a millennial reign right now. If that's happening, hey, we're not, and it is happening. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this is what I wanted to point out, and I want to let you know that Jesus Christ will reign from Jerusalem for one thousand years. Uh, he says Jesus Christ will reign from Jerusalem for one thousand years. Well, let's take a look what the Bible says. All right, let's take a look what the Bible says. In Luke chapter 1, verse 33, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So aside from claiming that Satan is a god, this fellow says that Jesus reigns for a thousand years, and then that's it apparently I mean you won't talk about it it would be something I would want to know about if I was you what happens when Jesus stops reigning you never made any mention of that did you so Jesus reigns 1,000 years and then what you take over is that what you believe I mean you don't say what am I to assume here? You're saying that Jesus will, his reign will end. I, I, there's no reason for me to believe otherwise. He reigns for a thousand years and then that's it. Well, what happens after that? He don't reign no more, apparently. Otherwise, he don't reign a thousand years. He reigns longer than a thousand years. But you don't say he reigns longer than a thousand years. You say he reigns a thousand years. The Word of God says Jesus reigns forever. Forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So who do I believe? This guy or the Word of God? I have no choice, but I got to believe the Bible. I got to believe the Word of God. I got to believe God over man. Now he's preaching this view that is supported by about 99.9% .9 of all the preachers in the world today. Maybe more, but that's a rough number, okay? I'm being probably probably being generous. All right, here's the problem. Revelation 20. He don't believe what Revelation 20 says. He continuously makes this claim of millennial reign. The millennial reign's not here. There's not a mention of a thousand year reign. It's not in Revelation 20 and it's not found anywhere at all in the Bible. I can't say, look, it's not there because look, it's not there. So let me show you what is there. All right, so we got the thousand year, maybe if I highlight thousand, Maybe this will help. Okay, so we see here 
Uh, let's see. Uh, let, let me just start at the top. Why not? Okay, so Satan's bound for a thousand years so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are fulfilled. They shall live and reign with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. And shall reign with him a thousand years and when the thousand years are expired. Okay. So there's our six mentions. Right. Did I get all six in? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's it. That's it. So... There's no mention of Jesus Christ reigning for a thousand years. I mean, that would be a contradiction to what we read in Luke chapter 1, verse 33. It would nullify the entire Bible if it said Jesus reigned a thousand years. It doesn't say Jesus reigns a thousand years. It don't say Christ reigns a thousand years. It doesn't even say that we reign a thousand years. So there is no thousand year reign period. What does it actually say? All right. So if you could focus your eyes on the screen right now and walk through this with me. They, speaking of us that are born of God, the saved. They lived and reigned with Christ. See, right now, we live and reign with Christ right now. Right now. How can you rightly say that you are saved, yet you're not reigning with Christ? That don't make any sense. you got... Christ living in you. You've got Jesus in you. You've got the Father in you. He has made his abode in you. When you are born of God, you have God in you. And God is reigning forever. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And therefore, if you have the Spirit of God in you, if you are born of God, you reign with God because God is in you and you are in God they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years now this is a, a, a unique time period from the time that Jesus that baby Jesus was born and done the works of God laid down his life and brought it back up again and ascended to heaven with the promise that he will return for us. It's a unique time period. Alright. And this is specifically exactly what this thousand years is referring to. The rest of the dead live not again. This should be a major clue. Because this means that they were not resurrected until after, until the thousand years were finished <laughs> how do you miss that I mean it's right there as plain as day well what happens is when your worldview is obstructed it's off you you're blind to the truth all right and so God does that because you don't believe what it actually says instead you believe what another man says and I already know this gentleman here, he didn't come up with this on his own. I already know. He got it from some other man that he looks and reveres more than God. He don't trust God to show him. He trusts this other man. And therefore, he deserves to believe a lie. The rest of the dead live not again is a clear indication of the resurrection. All right. Now, we can go numerous places with this here. Let me start off in Daniel 12, 
Verse 2, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is speaking of the resurrection. All right, so uh, let's, let's do it this way. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. All right, 1 Corinthians 15 speaks of the resurrection. All right, if I can figure out where I'm at here. Right there. Let's go. Uh, now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. That slept. Now, that's an interesting uh, verse there. Interesting wording, first fruits. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. How do you miss this? How do you miss this? The resurrection occurs at his coming. How do you miss that? It's incredible. It really is. It's a phenomenon. And this speaks directly to what we started this video out on. The fact that the Lord God Almighty blinds the minds of them that believe not. It's incredible. It really is. Because these people do not believe the Bible that they hold in their hands, they are blind. They can't see. The glasses and everything don't help. The only thing that's going to help is if you believe. That's it. The first resurrection. It's astonishing that people don't understand what that means. I just read for you. I just read it. Who's the first fruit? Or who's the first resurrection? Who who was the first resurrection? You think it's gonna be you? You're gonna be the first resurrection? Is that what you think? Well, then the resurrection, if that's the case, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was done in vain. There was no point to it. The fact of the matter is, Jesus Christ has done all the works for us. We are his sheep, and we follow him. He has led the way for us. He is God manifest in the flesh he has came into our body and he has torn down this body and he has built it back up into an immortal body and he has ascended to heaven with the promise that he will return for us and when he returns for us we will be as he is all right let me support that let me find a verse. I'm not so I'm just so you don't think I'm just making this up. All right. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is consistent with what we read here in 1 Corinthians 15, for example, when a mystery is shown to us. The mystery. Behold, a mystery. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound 
and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Right? For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. All right, so there will be no more death after this. And when does this happen? At the last trump, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. I don't know how you miss that, man. I, you know, it, it, you're, if you're preaching from Revelation, if you're preaching from Revelation 20, you got no excuse because in the very first verse, or very first chapter, excuse me, it reads, Behold, he comes with clouds. All right, so that's it. Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven at the end of the world. Of course, this is supported <laughs> everywhere. Oops. It's supported everywhere. Matthew 24. Same thing. Right? And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Same thing. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. It's the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. And this is all throughout the Bible. So, it's amazing, to, really. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord now how do you miss this according to this gentleman <clears throat> when Jesus comes that's not gonna happen or is it is it gonna happen or is it not gonna happen because if that happens you got a problem 1 Corinthians 15 When this happens then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory So what are you saying? There are going to be a thousand years of peace and then death then death is not swallowed up in victory This is a lie The Bible is a lie and you are the truth. The Word of God is not the Word of God. You are the Word of God. If that's true. If that's what you believe, just say it. I mean, why, why are you being so sneaky about it? Really? You don't have any regard for the Word of God whatsoever? Well, you're consistent with about 99.9% 99.9% .9 of the preachers today, they they will agree with you. Uh, I have no doubt about that. No doubt about that. Let's see if we can influence the word of God by this. So is God a liar and man true? Let's find out. God forbid. Yeah. Let God be true. But every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Yet yeah, no, God is true. Every man a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. Alright, so let's go back to Revelation 20. And just, uh, I want to, if anybody's still listening, okay. I know nobody cares what I have to say. I get it. But if, if anybody really did care, this stuff is so simple, it's amazing. It's amazing. It really is. 
the thousand years, like I said, it's from the time that Jesus ascended with the promise that he will return for us. All right, and then when he returns, that's the end of the thousand years. And the rest of the dead that live not again will be resurrected at the end of the thousand years, just like it says. And in verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. We that are born of God are partakers of his resurrection. He has led the way for us, and we are following him. We are partakers of his resurrection. We are partakers of the works of God. Right now, the second death has no power over us. Right now. You've probably heard me... Uh, talk about once saved always saved how important that is there's nothing more important if you're not once saved always saved that you're not saved at all John chapter 11 Jesus says I am the resurrection oh I can't figure out who the first resurrection is you never read this I am the resurrection and the life he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die Never die. The second death has no power over us that are born of God right now. now. This is amazing. It's right there. It's supported all throughout the Bible over and over and over and over and over. It's incredible. Yet people's minds are blinded because they do not believe. They don't believe what this says. So they, therefore, of course, they're going to teach this goofy stuff that, well, when Jesus comes, then he'll start to reign. He don't reign right now, but he'll reign when he comes, and then he'll reign for a thousand years, and then he'll stop reigning, and I'll take over, and I'll run this GD place. Really, if that's what you believe, then just say it. Just be honest with yourself, if anything. You got nothing to gain by lying to yourself. Uh, you might gain lots of followers, get some pats on the back for lying to people and deceiving them. But you got nothing to gain at all by lying to yourself. Just be honest about what it is that you believe. All right, now consider this. And this is amazing. I mean, this is not just a, a small blurb here. This is a big deal. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Well, who's, from what's this about? Priest of God and of Christ? Well, if you would have read Revelation chapter 1, you would have read and you would have saw if you would have believed. <laughs> That Jesus has made us kings and priests. All right, we are called to preach the gospel to every creature. Right now, we are kings and priests unto God. Right now, He has made us, made us right now, kings and priests unto God. Right now. And so, when you read, they shall be priests of God and of Christ, that means right now. We are priests of God and of Christ right now. And we reign with him right now. We that are born of God. All right. Let me see if I can help you out a little bit. Let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis 19. We were at Exodus 20 earlier. Let's go to Exodus 19. The chapter before the Ten Commandments. Verse, uh, let's start at verse 5. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and deed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. Now oh, wait a second, I thought Satan was, I thought the world belonged, I thought Satan was God of this world. Well, see, when you don't believe what the Bible says, you deserve to believe to be delusional you deserve it you deserve to believe a lie 
when you don't trust God and you trust in Reverend Schmitty over the Word of God, you deserve to be delusional. You really do. For all the earth is mine. This ain't Satan talking, by the way, just in case you're confused about that. All right. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. All right, so let's go. Let's go to. Uh, well, let's go to First Peter chapter two and find a parallel to gain some understanding. Hopefully, you notice here. Let's put these side by side. You notice here where it says uh, uh, in Exodus 19 a peculiar treasure a kingdom of priests and holy nation right and here in first Peter chapter 2 it says ye are chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people talking about those of us that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ we are the children of Israel we are the people of God we are born of God we are the sons of God all right so in Revelation 20 when it says they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years notice it doesn't say Jesus reigns a thousand years I right, you can repeat it until your face turns blue it ain't gonna change what it says it says they shall reign with him a thousand years again this is a unique time period that we're in right now from the time that Jesus has come into the flesh God has been manifest in the flesh right and done all the works for God and ascended to heaven from that time to the time of his return is a very unique special time period and that's all this is referring to when it says thousand years. The idea that this is a thousand years after he comes is bonkers. It's not supported and it would be a contradiction with the entire Bible. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loose. Well, how do you explain that? Well, it's not. It's not rocket science. Okay. So follow me let's try to try to understand this this <laughs> if you if you knew the Old Testament you knew the, the promises to Abraham and his seed and the children of Israel and how in the Old Testament there was one nation one nation where the kingdom of God was okay outside of that one nation was not the kingdom of God therefore it's fair to say those nations were deceived by Satan I don't know how you say they weren't deceived by Satan and Satan just simply means a spirit void of God that's it all right so they didn't have the kingdom of God outside of that nation. Okay. Outside of that nation was the nations deceived. You follow me on this? Cause it's it's really it's a lot simpler than what people put it. Okay. During the Old Testament, one nation, outside of that one nation were the nations deceived. All right, so Satan is bound. All right, here comes the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, and when he comes, he binds Satan for a thousand years. Now, what's that mean? Well, Jesus says so basically. Jesus tears down the wall 
All right, you remember Ronald Reagan? I don't know if anybody's old enough anymore to remember anything, let alone Ronald Reagan. But he he's the one that uh, told the people, uh, or he you know, made some big public announcement or whatever. Hey, talking to, was it Berlin or whoever he was talking to? Tear down that wall. And they tore down that wall. There was a wall dividing some people in a country. And it was causing conflict. And Ronald Reagan, yeah, apparently he's the one that made it happen. Where they tore down that wall. Well, Jesus had already torn down that wall. Alright. When he said the nation of, or the kingdom of God, excuse me, the kingdom of God should be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Alright, so he tore down that wall. Now, the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Alright, there is no longer just one nation of, of the kingdom of God. Alright, not one nation. God isn't looking over one group of people. All right, now the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Things are things have changed. And so now, because the kingdom of God is available to all around the world, there is no more nations being deceived by Satan. That no more are there nations completely void of God. Now, when Jesus returns, then we are lifted up into the air. Right? I showed you these verses already. For when the Lord shall descend from heaven with the shout of the voice of the archangel with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be cut up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. So we're up in the air with the Lord. Okay. Now there are still people on the earth. Right? There are still people down on the earth right 1st Corinthians 15 verse 25 for we must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet right so we're up in the air our enemies are at our feet this goes all the way back to Genesis 3 verse 15 when the Lord said to the serpent I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel Psalm 110 the Lord said unto my Lord sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstools or thy footstool excuse me uh, Revelation 3 verse 9 behold I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee see we're up in the air we're up in the air and our enemy is at our feet when the Lord comes in the clouds of heaven. Right? So what happens? So imagine that scenario. Now the kingdom of God is not on the earth. It is up in the air. And so therefore, it's a return to what it was like before Jesus came and tore down that wall. Right? Where in the Old Testament there was one nation outside of that one nation where the nation was deceived. Well, that one nation was now plucked up out of the earth, and now are all the nations deceived. Just like what we read here in Revelation 20. Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. I think a lot of people miss this. I really do. The purpose of this, of Satan being loosed, is to gather together the unsaved at our feet. 
That's the purpose. And when they are gathered at our feet, then fire comes down from God and devours them. This is when the Lord stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying evil forever. Right? This is the judgment of God, the great and terrible day of the Lord. All right, so when it says here, and they went up on the breath of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. Well, where's the beloved city? You can't put it on the earth. You can't. I'll give you two examples. It cannot be on the earth. First example, let's go to Revelation 21. And I, John saw the holy city all right are you following here i wonder about people's ability to comprehend anything the beloved city all right the beloved city the holy city it's the same city you understand that it's the same city so when john sees a new heaven and a new earth and he sees the holy city where's that it's in heaven therefore when we read the beloved city in revelation 20 it's got to be in heaven you can't have fire coming down from god out of heaven and de and just and what de devouring the city what are you teaching man To me, it sounds like you're an enemy of God. When you suggest that fire is going to come down from God and devour the beloved city that's on the earth, it's not on the earth. Well, it was it's in heaven now, and then it came down on the earth for a thousand years and then went back up to heaven and then comes back down again. I, what in the world are you teaching? Really? Let's go to Galatians 4. Jerusalem is in the Middle East. I see it on TV. Or no, that's not what it says. Galatians 4, verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. Which is the mother of us all. Jerusalem is above. Just like what we read in Revelation 21 and Revelation 20. It's above. It's above. You think about um, John 14. Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is in above. This is the beloved city, the city of God, the new Jerusalem. It's above. Right now, it's above. So in Revelation 20, when it says the beloved city, it's talking about above. And so we are above. When it says it encompassed the camp of the saints about, where are we at? On earth? No, we're above. The beloved city is above. We are the saints of God. We are above. This is this is not a one-time, one-trick pony, man. This is all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. When the Lord comes, we are lifted up to meet the Lord in the air. And so we are with God, that where I am, there ye may be also. So we're with God when fire comes down from God out of heaven. All right, I mean, it's this is overwhelming, man. Overwhelming evidence. Overwhelming evidence. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, and I'll try to close this out. Now this, it's mind-blowing. It really is. So... The heavens and the earth, which are now by the same order, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Just as this world was destroyed by water, this world would be destroyed by fire. I should say, as the old world was destroyed by water, this world would be destroyed by fire. Alright? It's pretty, it's pretty 
easy to understand that. I mean, I would think. Yeah, people can't figure it out, though. And I can't help them because they don't believe the Bible that they hold in their hands. That's why. So, therefore, they, they deserve to be delusional. They deserve to believe a lie. They deserve it. They deserve it. And, and it's not Satan that's causing them to be delusional. They don't even know what the Bible says. They have no idea that it's not Satan. It's themselves to blame because they do not believe. Second Peter chapter 3 The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night and this is clearly Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. Clearly. It's not, and it's not, you know, it's not a, you know, an, a, an additional return. It's not like, well, this is after a thousand years. You can't have this, this idea that Jesus is going to be in Jerusalem on the earth for a thousand years. It's ridiculous. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly ignorant, incredibly ignorant. Uh, it doesn't make any sense because you got him on the earth, and then he goes, and then he comes in the clouds of heaven. Is he going to see himself coming in the clouds of heaven? I mean, is it another Jesus? I mean, what's going on here? I mean, this stuff is just ridiculous. Okay, so let's get to the truth. The truth is that Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. He will. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Everything is going to be burned up. And this is not just a couple of things here. Everything is going to be burned up. The heavens and the earth shall pass away. Everything is going to be done away with. This world is going to be totally out when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Clearly, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. There's not going to be anything left. In, this, in Revelation 20, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours him. There's not going to be anything left. Your only chance is to be up in the air with the Lord. Your only chance. Your only chance. Notice here in verse 11, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, whose face the earth and heaven fled away. The heaven and the earth pass, passes away. The heaven and the earth passes away. The heaven and the earth passes away. The day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, whose face the earth and heaven fled away. Same thing. Same exact thing. It's just worded differently. Why would that confuse you? In Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, it talks about the sun being darkened, the moon shall not give her light, stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. And we read this in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 13, excuse me, thank you. Isaiah 13, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light, the sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. When is this? Well, if you never read Isaiah, you wouldn't know, would you? Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. You can't figure out what this is. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. This is the great and terrible day of the Lord. The great and terrible day. It's great for us and terrible for the unsaved. Here again in Joel chapter 2, For the day of the Lord is great and terrible. Who can abide it? The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. This is not going to be, all right, everybody, we're going to 
continue uh, this for a thousand years. You can go on and and do whatever you want and uh, blah, 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 blah. What in the world are you guys teaching? It says if you guys have no understanding whatsoever. And half the time I wonder if you've even never read the Bible. If you don't understand it, why are you preaching it? It's clear to me. It's clear as, as, as all can be. The reason why this is happening is because people do not believe the Bible that they hold in their hands. It's clear as day. <laughs> 